Good morning from the India China Institute at the New School, and welcome to today's panel on technopolitics, materialities, and legacies of infrastructure development in China. I'm Mark Frazier, co director of ICI and professor of politics at the New School. It's my great honor to introduce our panelists, each of whom will speak for about 10 minutes before we turn it over to you for questions and discussion. Feel free to put your question in the Q&A box at any time. And if you would, let us know who you are and to whom your question is directed. As the director of the China Made Project, Tim Oakes will first make some introductory remarks about China Made. Tim is a professor of geography and director of the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. His recent work explores the development and use of leisure and consumption spaces in urban and urbanizing areas of China. And today in his presentation, Tim will talk about infrastructural urbanism and new area development in China. Alessandro Ripa is project director of a research group on China's green development in Southeast Asia at the Rachel Carson Center in Munich. He's the author of Borderland Infrastructures, Trade, Development, and Control in Western China, published last year by Amsterdam University Press. He's an associate professor of Chinese studies at Tallinn University in Estonia and received his PhD in social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen in 2015. Ale will provide an overview of the project touching on its themes of technopolitics, materialities, and legacies of infrastructure development in China. Dorothy Tang is doctoral a doctoral student at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning and a visiting fellow at the National University of Singapore. She's a landscape architect whose work engages with urban and rural communities situated in landscapes confronting large scale environmental change. Her current research projects include a study of Chinese infrastructural developments and investments in Southeast Asia. She received her master's in landscape architecture from Harvard University and is a registered landscape architect in the state of New York. Dorothy will talk about infrastructures of water security in Hong Kong in the geopolitical context of Hong Kong's transition from a British colony to a special administrative region of the PRC. Darren Byler is a postdoctoral researcher at the China Made Project, joining us from early dawn in Seattle, Washington, which is where he also received his PhD in anthropology at the University of Washington in 2018. His forthcoming book with Duke University Press is titled Terror Capitalism, Uyghur Dis Dispossession in a Chinese City, which focuses on the effects of digital culture and production and surveillance, new forms of capitalism, and mass internment in Urumqi. Darren is a regular contributor to public understandings of Uyghur human rights issues, having provided testimony to the Canadian House of Commons and writing op-ed columns and doing media interviews to bring attention, especially to corporate supply chains and their connections with Chinese companies operating in Xinjiang. Darren today will talk about the infrastructures of carceral industrial parks in Xinjiang. I will now turn it over to him, to Tim for his welcoming remarks. And thanks everyone. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, it's great to, uh, to, great to be with you and great to be here for this event. And thank you um, for the invitation for um, giving us an opportunity to offer a little bit of a, a China made sampler <laughs> um, this morning. Uh, I just, I'm just gonna say just a couple quick things um, about the project and kind of where it came from before I turn things over to Ale. Um, you know, China Made is a research collaborative uh, exploring the socio-technical and technical political dimensions of Chinese development uh, with a focus on infrastructure, on China's outbound infrastructure investment and regionally with a focus on Southeast Asia in particular. Um, two broad principles govern the work that we do. First, um, that in order to understand China's outbound uh, development projects, you have to look at the projects themselves um, as material events involving social, cultural, political, and economic dimensions uh, studied qualitatively at a local scale. So in other words, China Made is not about China's geopolitical strategies or ambitions, but about the actual projects on the ground and the, uh, the socio-technical dimensions of, of, of them. <clears throat> 
The second principle is that in order to understand China's outbound uh, infrastructure uh, development projects, a thorough understanding of China's domestic uh, development experience is necessary. Uh, that is, China is explicitly a transboundary project, uh, even as it is committed to on the ground place based um, fine grained um, analysis. Uh, we keep a focus on the connections between those projects and uh, the domestic context from which um, they emerge, or at least I used to say partially emerge. <laughs> uh, a third thing that I would mention is not really a principle, but more of an orientation, and that is uh, China Made is not a project designed to study the Belt and Road Initiative, <laughs> even though it might be useful for that. Um, but it's a project designed to discover what focusing on infrastructure can tell us about China. Um, and that is you know, the Chinese state, global China, local governments and governance in China, urbanization, statecraft, social formations, all sorts of things that we could put in that, in that box, ethnic relations. Um, and it's also designed to provide some insights uh, into what understanding China as an infrastructural state uh, can contribute to a broader field of infrastructure studies uh, beyond China. The project grew out of conversations that took place in Hong Kong while I was a visiting professor at the Hong Kong Institute of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences a few years back. And Dorothy was part of those conversations um, at that time, as was Max Hirsch, uh, who's another principal uh, investigator in the China, Pro uh, China Made project. Um, and the uh, Hong Kong Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences is a, is a, um, co a collaborative partner uh, in this project. Uh, over the past few years, we've also grown to develop partnerships uh, with the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore, uh, as well as the Asian Institute at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Um, along with the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, each of these partners have helped shape the vision of the project as well as committed resources to its development. And so we're very grateful for our, all our partners for helping make the work that we do possible. Um, finally, none of this would have been possible without the generous support and frankly, encouragement from the Henry Luce Foundation. And so we are in the Luce Foundation's debt for this. Um, and so thank you for that. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alessandro and uh, we will get started. Great to be here. Thanks, Tim. I'm going to share um, my presentation very quickly. Um, thank you, Mark, for um, the kind introduction. Thank you for having us. And also thank you to uh, you and Grace for, for organizing. Um, as you mentioned, I'm now, I'm now based in uh, between Tallinn and, and Munich, uh, but I um, was a postdoc on the Shanamate project in, in Boulder between 2018 and 2019. And so picking up from Tim, Today, I will briefly go through some of the uh, themes that we uh, engage with as part of the first two project workshops that I was directly involved with, uh, focusing in particular on the second one in Hong Kong, which dealt with uh, China's domestic infrastructure. And as a result of that workshop, we're now working on a, on a special issue for the journal China Quarterly, which I will briefly um, outline. Um, so first, a little bit of, of background, again, building on, on and, and expanding on, on Tim's um, uh, presentation now. Um, the first China Made workshop took place um, at the University um, of Colorado in Boulder in October 2018. And its main objective was to develop um, a theoretical and methodological agenda for bringing um, infrastructure studies into conversation with China's domestic and export infrastructure. The workshop was based on the premise that while China reinforces its global role as a leading spender in infrastructure development, the most influential works in the social sciences on the subject originate from empirical research conducted elsewhere. So why was it that China, the uh, paradigmatical infrastructure state, as Jonathan Bach of the New School, who was at our workshop in Boulder, put it, why was China absent from most critical discussions on infrastructure in human geography, in anthropology and science and technology studies. And so to begin addressing this gap, the workshop brought together scholars working on infrastructure, both inside and outside of China. 
And so building, um, building on this in the second workshop that took place at the Hong Kong Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences in January 2020, we brought such insights into conversation with China's domestic infrastructure. And the aim here was to develop methods and theoretical approaches leading to um, what also Tim referred to, to a finer grain understanding of China's model of development. Now these aims, again, needs to be understood against um, the following backdrop. In the most recent literature, investigations of Chinese infrastructure have largely focused on infrastructure's pivotal role in China's foreign policy and China's development aid initiatives. This approach uh, obviously lent itself to analysis of the geopolitical implications of, for instance, the Belton Road Initiative and the political economic dimensions of infrastructure investment as a spatial fix for China's chronic overproduction crisis, as well as a vehicle to meet growing demand in natural resources. And here I have a couple of examples perhaps of that. Now with the second workshop and the China Made project more broadly, our goal was rather to shift the focus away from geopolitical and political economic considerations of Chinese infrastructure to a more ethnographic examination of infrastructures themselves, as well as of the practices that surround and enable them. In particular, we were interested in how infrastructure contributes to the construction of material landscape, obviously, but also social, political, and cultural formations. And so based on such conversations, we then asked how such a grounded focus can inform our understanding of China's development efforts, both domestically and abroad. So very much beginning with the infrastructure itself, its materialities, its politics, its ecologies, rather than with the broader geopolitical implications. And so the three key vectors of inquiry that resulted from this approach and that we organized the, the Hong Kong workshop around were the following. First, the question of what can a study of infrastructure tell us about the Chinese state. And so moving beyond a simplistic understanding of China as a highly centralized authoritarian state, a grounded approach to infrastructure shows how the state is multi-scalar and internally incoherent, made up of actors operating on their own motives and interests that are often in conflict with one another. But also, what is infrastructure's role in processes of state formation and state territorialization? And how does the state reproduce it itself through infrastructure? So in Hong Kong, we had papers from Max Hirsch, from Darren Beiler, from Darcy Pan, which focused on different kinds of infrastructure, airports, prison camps, server farms, to show their particular legacies, domestic and international, and what these tell us about Chinese state power. Secondly, we were interested in tracing these specific and often overlooked socialist legacies in and of contemporary infrastructure projects. And so ranging from the notorious and much discussed zone, a form of socialist experimentation turning into a symbol of global trade and neoliberal development to relocation projects and top-down approaches to rural de development, we asked how China's socialist legacies are shaping the country today and what role does infrastructure play in such process. Tim Oaks talked about the zone in this regard and Elizabeth Cole drew a long durée portrait of the city of Puko from the early 20th century until the present. And third, we wanted to shed light on the environmental components of China's infrastructural development and on the ideology underpinning China's approach to ecological issues. This is particularly relevant as the country has become a prominent advocate of sustainable technologies and its export infrastructure projects are increasing, increasingly branded as part of a green Belt and Road. And so Emily Ye talked about environmental infrastructural politics in the era of ecological civilization based on recent research in Sichuan and Tyler Harlan focused on clean energy production and export in Yunnan. Additionally, and particularly given the location of the workshop, we were interested in discussing Hong Kong as a particular entry point into the analysis of China's infrastructure. As demonstrated by the recent inauguration, for instance, of the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, Hong Kong can be seen as both a showcase of China's infrastructural hubris 
and as an example of the interconnection between infrastructure development and state territorialization. We had papers by Caroline Cartier on the National Palace Museum and the West Kowloon Cultural District, Andrew Tolland on um, Hong Kong's artificial island landscape, and Dorothy Tang on Hong Kong's water infrastructure. And I think we will hear more on this from her in a moment. Now, I conclude by going through uh, some of the key takeaways from the workshop that informed the introduction to the special issue that we are um, currently working on um, together. So first of all, we foreground a discussion of how the infrastructural basis of China's approach to development and statecraft deserves a more careful theorizing of infrastructure than what we have seen so far in the China studies field. What does it mean then to think infrastructurally about China's development? And so as Tim Oaks argued, infrastructural thinking pulls together two broad strands of inquiry. One involves an interest in rethinking the materiality of infrastructure, not as an inert or relatively stable and passive basis for dynamic social processes, but rather as an unstable assemblage of human and non-human agencies. Um, another explores the oftentimes hidden political or techno-political work of infrastructural forms. So infrastructural thinking draws our attention to how social relations are bound up in the physical and technical materialities of our built environment and to how those materialities constitute social relations in ways that produce unexpected and often unintended political outcomes. So building on this, in our introduction, we identify five analytical categories that we find particularly relevant to think with in the case of China. Technopolitics refers to how infrastructure development is inseparable from the project of consolidating state power in China. Infrastructure projects have been central to state legitima legitimation along with state visions of development, modernity and progress since well before the funding of the PRC, of course, but the Socialist Party state organization was and is particularly fooled and shaped by the technical, fiscal, social and political requirement of large scale infrastructure projects. Nature as infrastructure, this echoes an argument made by Ashley Kars in his work on the Panama Canal and helps us rethinking how conservation programs based on nature-based services approaches and the broad framework of an ecological civilization often blur the analytical distinction between infrastructure and the environment. And so nature here becomes another infrastructure space of sorts, one that is valued for the kind of services that it can provide. Infrastructure space here refers to a concept um, developed by Keller Esterling in her work Extra Statecraft that Tim engages with at length in his paper. Other papers in the issue make use of this notion in the Chinese context to address special zones, spaces of, of exceptions, as in Darren's work on, on Xinjiang, as well as frontiers and borderlands of various kinds. This speaks to another key aspect of infrastructure in China. We argue that China's infrastructure-led development at home and abroad is not necessarily pushing for connectivity. Its infrastructure model of development doesn't aim at flow or exchange, but also at control, and it's ultimately centered on state territorial power. This casts new light on this so-called China model of development. And here we trace some of the legacies, socialist, but also transnational, that went into this model. We are not ultimately convinced of the usefulness of this notion. And in fact, most of the contributions to the special issue do not engage with the model itself, but rather the mundane everyday encounters with infrastructure that condition people's lives. Now, building on this later point, and before I hand it over to Dorothy, I wanted to point out that the next project workshop, the third, will take place at the Asia Research Institute in Singapore this coming May, and will focus on Chinese investment in Southeast Asia. So we are very much looking critically at the China model in this particular context. There is a good chance that the workshop will take place online, and so there could be a possibility for those of you who are interested to listen in um, and to participate. So we'll be sharing details in due course on the China Made website, as well as through Twitter and social media, so um, which you can find here. And I will stop here.
And thank you again very much. And I look forward to the discussion. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am really pleased to present my paper. And Ali gave a really great description of Hong Kong's um, geopolitical significance, um, as well as some of the controversies um, related to questions of autonomy um, and integration into China that the territory currently um, uh, faces. And so I I'll just start with this image of the Greater Bay Region. Um, Hong Kong is a city just south of um, the Pearl River Delta. It is highly integrated um, internationally as well as um, regionally through infrastructure, the recent Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, um, the uh, the uh, high-speed rail connections. These are all physical infrastructures that um, have made Hong Kong even more integral to China. And oftentimes narratives of Hong Kong start with this question um, or start with the role of this former British colony as a mediator between China and the West, um, as a conduit for capital and expertise. Um, and today the narrative that I am going to depict uh, perhaps challenges those assumptions about integration and sovereignty a little bit. Um, and I'm going to go back all the way to sort of post-war Hong Kong's development and its relationship to freshwater infrastructure. So just to give you a sense of what is going on, I use freshwater infrastructure, um, especially its development in the 1960s and 70s, to unpack debates of autonomy and integration. And this is during the British colonial rule. And so it provides um, a, a counter narrative to this idea that questions of autonomy are only relevant today um, as Hong Kongers kind of grapple with the relationship with mainland China. I hope that this provides some insights to why these questions are still relevant and how that actually impacts sort of larger urban development trajectories. So this timeline, just to give you a sense of the major events that I'm looking at, um, this paper focuses on two water emergencies in 1963 and 64 and 1967. It then sort of jumps ahead to the Sino-British Joint Declaration in um, 1984 um, that declares the intention that uh, Hong Kong will return to Chinese sovereignty. So these are the kind of major political events. Um, I also mapped out the different infrastructural developments over time. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is the, the sort of green, the sorry, not green, blue bars at the bottom, which depict how much water is imported from China. So the, the blue bars are actually Chinese um, imported water and the black bars are um, what Hong Kong has produced on its own. So um, Hong Kong's freshwater infrastructure system is fascinating and it, it uh, consumes the majority of the territory. Currently about 40% of the territory um, is country parks or conservation land. And the majority of that boundary is actually formed around watersheds that support major water impounding reservoirs throughout the territory. I wanna draw your attention to um, Plover Cove and High Island Reservoir over here and over here um, that were completed in 1968 and 1978. Um, and together they, prov they provide about 88% of Hong Kong's entire freshwater storage capacity. And they were built in the time, um, this period of, of interest. Um, so another fun fact, um, approximately three quarters of Hong Kong's freshwater supply is currently purchased from Guangdong. Um, and it's only until 1982 that Hong Kong did not have regular water rationing. Um, and so they're, they're, the timeline is important because it demonstrates the degree to which Hong Kong does rely on China, but also a struggle for autonomy um, and water security, um, even during the British colonial era. So one of the arguments I make in this paper is that Hong Kong's um, landscape is actually shaped by a narrative of scarcity. When the British first came to Hong Kong, they described Hong Kong as a barren rock. Um, that had, you know, um, eroded hillsides, had no running water, 
Um, and this idea of scarcity, this idea that a barren rock is now this successful metropolis um, is a really important part of the political narrative of Hong Kong, how Hong Kong has succeeded and its role in greater China. But this is greatly tied to how its landscape over time has been managed. Um, and water scarcity is a critical part of this narrative. In particular, the water emergencies of 1963 and 64, as well as 1967, exemplify the fragile geopolitical negotiations between the British and Chinese and coincided with significant technological innovations and major landscape transformations within the territory, which I argue were out of political necessity. Over time, the Hong Kong government has managed a very fragile balance between maximizing local water production and dependence on imported water, um, and the scales of water infrastructure are adjusted and reconfigured during critical times of political tension and conflict. And so before I continue, I wanted to set the stage of what is happening in Hong Kong during this time. After World War II and the Chinese Civil War, um, British, British sovereignty over Hong Kong was actually very tenuous and uncertain. This uncertainty not only shaped the future governance of the colony, but it also produced a paradoxical relationship between engineering water independence and meeting the growing demand for a massive influx of migration and a growing industrial sector. And here in this image you see um, uh, in 1970, an image produced by the Hong Kong government information services that depict how um, water scarcity is such an important part of Hong Kong culture. It talks about hardship um, and how the colony over time through its infrastructural development actually created um, uh, a way out of these hardships and difficulties and the role of um, the benevolent role of the colonial government. However, this, um, I will argue that this is actually a kind of a, a false narrative um, in sort of the subsequent um, narrative. So I'm gonna start with the 1963 um, water emergency. Um, this was one of the most severe water emergencies in Hong Kong's history over a year and a half um, people had to deal with water rationing. They had to go to standpipes to get water in buckets. Um, and more importantly, at its peak, you could only get four hours of running water over a four period, day period of time. And so people would fill up their bathtubs um, and any vessels they had in their households. Um, but this also depended on water pressure. And so there was an uneven distribution of water throughout this year and a half. Um, and so here, what you see is the construction of an aqueduct from China that provided um, water from one of the Pearl River's uh, tributaries to, um, to the Shenzhen Reservoir that in turn sold water to Hong Kong during this time of crisis. Um, and, oops, um, and so it, it's, it's interesting because infrastructure development on the Chinese side played also a very important role in shaping Hong Kong's um, water infrastructure. So just to go back a little bit, in 1959, um, the Shenzhen Reservoir, which is literally right across the border from Hong Kong, was constructed within four months. This was part of the Great Leap Forward and was part of China's um, attempt for technological advancement um, that utilizes sort of mass mobilization model of politics um, to accomplish these um, infrastructure projects. Irrigation reservoirs were a major part of this effort and the Shenzhen Reservoir was initially constructed for that purpose. It was constructed just in time for a major drought in 1960 um, and the British colonial government reached an agreement with China for a modest amount of imported water from the um, at Shenzhen Reservoir. And so this was the first phase of creating a connection between Shenzhen and Hong Kong. In the 1963 um, water shortage, um, what happened was that Hong Kong um, approached the Guangdong authorities again to ask for more water. Um, but the Shenzhen Reservoir, because I mean, the drought was widespread and was regional, had no water left. And so the, the British colonial government was going to take these water tankers, go to the mouth of the Pearl River and literally ship water in boats to Hong Kong to um, alleviate some of this, uh, some of the, the emergencies. 
Um, and Guangdong initially was going to offer this water for free. They said, this is a national calamity and we want to help you um, through sharing this water. But the British colonial government insisted on paying the um, market rate for water that they had agreed on because they were worried about future political leverage. Um, however, it was during this particular water emergency that the British realized that it was impossible to supply water for Hong Kong's um, emerging urbanism. So they proposed that they would provide expertise and pay for an aqueduct that would connect a tributary of the Pearl River directly to the Shenzhen Reservoir, um, just in case in the future um, we needed more water. Um, and the Chinese declined British expertise. They decided that they were going to use the technologies and techniques that they had developed during the Great Leap Forward. Um, and instead of an enclosed aqueduct, actually constructed an open aqueduct um, to Shenzhen, um, even though the British eventually paid for it. Um, and so this is uh, sort of the contrast between how the British approached questions of water scarcity um, and the kind of fraught political relationship with China. Um, so planning for water security was, was always been on the British colonial government's mind. Before these emergencies, Hong Kong had already been looking for alternative solutions to water scarcity. In 1958, the Plover Cove scheme was commissioned in an effort to um, convert a bay in the northeast part of the territory into a freshwater reservoir. This is the first of its kind anywhere in the world, and it promised to immediately triple the water production of the territory at completion. And the technical challenges of converting a saltwater cove into a freshwater reservoir required a great level of engineering innovation. So the total height of the dam is about 44 meters tall. It's constructed on ground that is 28 meters below sea level, um, and required the dredging of a 200 meter wide foundational trench across its length. So all of these, especially at that time, required huge engineering innovation um, and sort of British engineers that had been working in other post-colonial settings uh, were brought in to uh, accomplish this. But the biggest challenge of all was removing salinity from the reservoir bed. So the engineers proposed a process where the majority of the seawater would get pumped out after um, the dams were built, um, and then leaving just enough, enough water so you don't avoid, uh, you don't disturb the sea mud, and then you dilute the remaining water by pumping in um, the first uh, 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 rainwater um, flush, and you keep pumping in and out water until the salinity levels met certain drinking water standards. Um, and they, they estimated that this process would take about a year or a year and a half, depending on um, the, the wet season um, and what salinity levels would um, be uh, uh, acceptable. But this all came to a head in 1967, a year before Plover Cove was scheduled to come on board. There, were, there was a dual crisis in Hong Kong. There were the 1967 anti-British government riots that were arguably funded and encouraged by communist China during um, the, the Cultural Revolution. Um, and there was a water emergency. And the riots were significant because the British colonial government actually seriously contemplated leaving Hong Kong due to this political unrest. Um, and I'll explain later why it was a turning point um, for governance in the colony. So in order to understand why these, this dual event is important, I'm just gonna give you a brief timeline of how things played out. So the planning for Clover, Clover Cove begins in 1958 um, throughout the water emergency, even though the Dongshan Aqueduct was completed. Um, and in 1967, um, there were six months of violent riots with 51 deaths. That included um, um, an embargo of food imports from China, um, and it coincided with the end of the annual water supply period from China between June and October. And this was, uh, this was scary for the British colonial government because they had approached the Chinese government um, about providing more water to Hong Kong. And uh, China essentially ghosted Hong Kong and refused to return um, any of the communication 
Um, and so part of the problem and the crisis that the British colonial government had was in the midst of all of this, they didn't know whether China would turn the taps on again on October 1st. Um, and so what they end up, ended up doing was that they decided even though Plover Cove wasn't complete yet, the water was still saline, but because there was a major rain event in July, um, of 1967, they decided to mix that saline water with fresh water supply to what WHO considered um, acceptable levels for fresh water um, um, consumption um, as a way to alleviate the burden of, um, of, of this crisis. And so this was hugely controversial in Hong Kong. Um, the, the leftist um, local Chinese paper, um, Da Gong Bao, basically argued that the British government um, was poisoning its citizens um, in retaliation to the riots. Um, and so, um, and another controversy was that um, some communities uh, would complain that they had more saline water than the rich communities in, um, in the peak or other um, parts of uh, sort of more expat um, Hong Kong. And so the water authority had to issue statements such as quote, we have modified our water distribution to distribute saline water as widely and fairly as we can. People on the peak get the same sort of water as anyone in Wan Chai or Yamate, unquote. And these complaints were more than just petty concerns. The British colonial government um, had just suffered a huge blow to their credibility and ability to govern Hong Kong due to the riots. And while the colony would see extensive social reforms in the upcoming decades, this was a very delicate time. The deputy colonial secretary was concerned about how discontent with saline water was being exploited by communists, unquote, and um, fresh water from China was offered as a propaganda measure. And so these were real concerns um, in the British colonial government. Um, and so what's interesting is that the unintended consequence of bringing Plover Cove on board before the planned conversion from a marine environment to a freshwater reservoir actually increased the polarization and politicization of Hong Kong's water resources. The direct result of this was that Hong Kong decided that they would maximize water resources production as much as possible. So they strengthened local water supply first by actually expanding the height of Plover Cove Reservoir by four meters. Um, second, they commissioned an even larger um, reservoir scheme, which is the Hila Island um, scheme that would be online in 1978. And third, the government revisited options for desalination um, and this is an architectural rendering of what would be considered the world's largest desalinization plant um, at that particular time, which was highly expensive um, and technically very difficult. It was built and it came on board for two years and was decommissioned shortly after because of the fuel crisis. However, despite all of this, there was simply not enough water to be produced within the territorial boundaries of Hong Kong. Um, and so even with the High Island coming on board, um, uh, Hong Kong had to increase its um, reliance on China and started importing more water, even at the completion of this new um, infrastructure development. And by 1984, with the Sino-British Declaration, um, what you see are two events. One is the end of water rationing in um, 1982. Um, and by 1984, what actually happened was that Hong Kong started importing approximately 50% of its water from China and, and completely um, took a 180 turn from self um, uh, from producing its own water to actually relying on water from China. Um, and so um, as part of the infrastructural development in the late 80s and 90s, uh, Hong Kong transformed its water storage, uh, sorry, its water pr production reservoirs to water storage reservoirs that would take water from China as its primary purpose rather than collecting water with its, its boundaries. And a part of this, as you see here in this um, image, is increasing pumping capacity um, and connectivity between the various reservoirs and water uh, production sites. Um, and uh, also an, in, an upgrade to the aqueduct um, in China. And so by 19, uh, 2019, 75% of Hong Kong's water 
was from China. And this is just sort of to review the, the various events that led up to this point. And so water security has continued to play an important role in post-colonial discussions of the future of Hong Kong. In 2017, a policy think tank, Civic Exchange, criticized Hong Kong's water security strategy in relationship to increased competition in the water, Dongjiang watershed. And the water supplies department um, issued a rebuttal stating, quote, unlike Singapore, where water is imported from another country and drastic actions are required to enhance water security, Hong Kong imports water from her motherland, which provides a higher level of water security, unquote. And this discourse actually translates in, into urban development. In 2017, also, a team of real estate researchers at the University of Hong Kong looked at reviving large-scale reclamation as a way to increase land supply and deal with housing shortages in Hong Kong. They suggested the reclamation of Plover Cove Reservoir that it, they argued is no longer relevant um, because we now import water from China. Um, that would provide up to 12,000 hectares of land um, and essentially the size of a complete new town. Um, this comes into question because narratives of scarcity since the conception of Hong Kong as a city has provided technocratic cover to suppress sort of local resistance and ongoing geopolitical negotiations between mainland China and Hong Kong. The two emergencies shaped and solidified opposing narratives, narratives of water scarcity based on their particular affinities to mainland China. Um, and each political shift and crisis determines the territorial extent um, in which Hong Kong is entitled to in order to meet water demand and the types of water infrastructure necessary. So this diagram actually shows how Hong Kong, despite the fact that they receive water from their motherland of China, still pays an, a, a huge amount of money to China in order for their water rights. And this money goes to um, the, uh, the Guangdong um, Water Supply Company, but it also goes to watershed development and protection on the upper reaches of, um, of the watershed. And so despite these narratives of autonomy and self-sufficiency, um, as well as questions of integration, um, what has happened here is that the physical infrastructure of Hong Kong actually precedes these questions. And um, one could argue um, shapes the political discourse um, and development of Hong Kong. So I'm gonna end my um, presentation here. I think I went over time um, and we will discuss more in a little bit. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so now I'm going to take you to another frontier of global China, to Northwest China, to the, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and talk a bit about the relationship between infrastructure and labor uh, in the context of, of, of the camp system that's being built, has been built uh, to target Muslim minorities in this part of China. So many of you probably know about the camp systems uh, that have been built, you've seen them in the news. There's around 300 or so um, that have been identified across the region. Um, and what I'm focusing on here is not the camps themselves or what's happening inside the camps per se, uh, but rather the factory systems that have been built in association with them. Um, so in 2018, we started to see factories being built uh, adjacent to camps, and we started to see government reports talking about um, former detainees and other, and other people, people coming from villages being sent to work in these factories. Um, so if we zoom in a little bit on these camp and factory complexes, which are typically labeled industrial parks um, on, in government rhetoric, um, we see that there's, um, a, in some cases, quite close proximity between the, the formal enclosure spaces that are actually uh, medium security prisons in terms of the, the actual infrastructure of, of the detention centers and the factories. So the, this is a shoe factory here. Um, these are dormitories for workers. Um, and this is the, the detention center itself. Um, there's actually a whole, uh, like another 12 fac shoe factories, uh, factory buildings behind this one. If we zoom inside the buildings, um, this is the kind of work that's going on inside these shoe factories, uh, Uyghur laborers. 
Um, the majority, it, it appears, are women, or there's a, a higher proportion of women uh, relative to the, the camp detainees who are mostly men. Um, probably two thirds or so are, are, that are in the camps are, are men. Um, they are manufacturing shoes in, in the context of Khoten, uh, mostly for domestic consumption, um, although some global brands are also implicated in, in, in this particular complex, some Fila uh, shoe brand has been manufacturing some shoes here. The factory owners who are working in this space look like these guys, um, they're coming from other places in China, from um, some of them from Sichuan in this case, others from Fujian. Um, and they're there as representatives of their factories, but also of local government in, in Eastern and Central China. Um, Hotan and, and all the areas throughout Xinjiang have um, developed partnerships with other, other localities in China um, called pairing assistance programs or age Xinjiang programs. Um, and there's government incentives for people to relocate to this space. Um, the factory owners understand that their role is, is both to uh, make money and to uh, train these workers, uh, these indigenous native Muslim workers to be productive industrial workers. What stands in between the, the factory owners and the workers is infrastructure in, in many cases. Um, to move between uh, the, 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 the factory compound and the detention center, you go through checkpoints. Um, there's checkpoints at each of them. And here is where, where people have their ID scanned and then matched to their face. They have their cell phone scanned as well, the, the, this device behind. Um, the, the turnstile is, is a, a data door that actually collects data from your phone. Um, they also often have their phone physically scanned. Um, inside the factory and the, the detention center are, are quite uh, sophisticated surveillance systems uh, that are monitoring behavior as well. So why are they moving um, factories to Xinjiang? Uh, well, one of the things you need to understand is that uh, Xinjiang is home to around 84% of Chinese cotton production, or, or it's, it's where it's grown. Um, and so the state has been quite clear about wanting to relocate labor to this part of China. Um, by 2023, they want to move 1 million textile jobs uh, to Xinjiang, which will be about 1 in 10 or 1 in 11 textile workers will be located in Xinjiang. Um, makes a lot of sense that you'd want to locate the, the site of production at 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 the space where the, the product is actually grown. Um, but there's an additional incentive, which is that labor cost is increasing in Eastern China. Already jobs are leaving China to go to places like Vietnam, places like Bangladesh. Um, and so finding a new source of cheap labor inside the country um, provides a, a sort of fix to the escape of, 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 of labor to other places. So in 2018, the, the Xinjiang Development Ministry talked about the camps as becoming a carrier of the economy, a carrier of economic stability. And so it's now kind of at the same level as oil and natural gas and, and cotton, these other commodities that had driven the, the, the economy in the past and really had been the underlying antagonism that had brought settlers to the Uyghur space and, and produced the cycle of violence that led eventually to the camps. Um, so it's, it's moving from you know, capturing material um, possession, the, the land and the resources to now actually uh, targeting the labor of, of, of Uyghurs. Um, human resources are, are what they're after now. Um, a lot of this is framed around a discourse of poverty alleviation, which is a nationwide project. Um, there's a really excellent book by Jennifer Pan that talks about this system. Um, and what she identifies is that there's a sort of institutional seepage that, that is brought to bear through poverty alleviation programs, which target poor people, um, people that have been formerly incarcerated, people that are petitioning for, for um, greater protections, um, and ethnic minorities. Um, so oftentimes these programs provide jobs of some sort, um, but they also provide surveillance mechanisms and an extension of state power into these into the, the, the communities that are, are targeted by these programs. In the, the Western part of the country in Tibet and Xinjiang, um, this 
program uh, becomes a sort of unwanted gift, which is something that Emily Ye has talked about in her work. Because Emily Ye is another part of it, another um, uh, another uh, investigator inside the China Made Project. Um, in her book, she talks about how you know Tibetans were given this gift of development um, that they really didn't want, um, but they had no choice to accept. Another scholar, Andrew Fisher, has talked about this as a, a form of disempowered uh, development because really what the development aid actually does is it benefits the settler population, the Han people that are, are bringing the aid to, to the space rather than the, the native population who is ostensibly targeted by the development. Um, this is because they're not given positions of institutional power um, and they're often pushed off of their land and into these disempowered roles. Um, in Xinjiang, I'm seeing something quite similar, um, but what I'm adding to this conversation is, is thinking through infrastructure. So just to zero in on this and kind of give it a human face, um, in January of last year, right, as, right after the Hong Kong workshop that we did, I went to Kazakhstan and interviewed um, a number of people, um, around 40 people or so, that had come across the border fairly recently to Kazakhstan from Xinjiang. One of the people I interviewed was Gulzira Al Khan, who is a, a Kazakh woman uh, who was detained in 2018 uh, after coming back from Kazakhstan to China. Um, she was found guilty of, of watching Turkish TV shows where people wore hijabs, of traveling to Kazakhstan, of having a passport, of being under the age of 55, all, all signs of potential extremism. So she was detained for a year in a camp. Um, and then uh, was released for several days and she thought maybe she would be able to return to her, her normal life or some, some form of normalcy. Uh, but instead the local authorities in her village said, now you're going to go work in this factory uh, making gloves. That's um, about seven kilometers from the camp where she had been held for the previous year. Um, so she, you know, of course is going through a lot of trauma because the camp experience is, is really brutal. Um, it's crowded cells. Um, using a bucket as a toilet, being beaten uh, for spending too much time on that bucket, um, witnessing all forms of, of, of symbolic and, and you know, physical violence. Um, and yeah, so, so she's kind of dealing with this post-traumatic stress and then being placed in this factory space. Inside the factory, she recognized her boss, uh, who was this man, Wang Xinghua, um, she had seen him in the camp, um, you know, inspecting different cells, um, which was unusual because the camps are gender segregated. And so seeing a, a strange Han man, you know, someone that they weren't familiar with coming into the space was a, a sort of event. Um, and it turned out that he had selected her to be a worker in his factory because she had found out that she had this past experience as a seamstress. Here he's speaking in a, in a state media interview, talking about the poverty alleviation work that he's doing. Um, he said that he's providing 2000 jobs to Uyghurs and Kazakhs uh, in 2018. Um, so he's, it's, a, it's a real success story. Um, his parent company back in Hebei only had 200 employees. So there's a, been a radical expansion in his business, most of it going to, to Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, he said uh, that in 2018, they generated $6 million in sales. Um, so it's, it's been good business. What he neglects to say in this TV interview is that he was paying Guzira and the other workers only around 300 yuan per month, which is uh, less than a sixth of a minimum wage. Um, on top of this, he would pay them a penny and a half as a sort of piecemeal rate uh, for, for gloves, pairs of gloves that they sold, that they, that they sewed. Um, Gulzira said on her best day, she could sew 13 pairs of gloves. Um, so the, really not much money at all is being made here. Um, the way that this uh, payment scheme was justified was that he talked about the, the former detainees as interns. Um, so they didn't deserve a full wage because they were in training. Um, and also there could be wage garnishment because they were being fed and housed and they were given transportation back to their home villages for a, a brief visit with their families. Gozira told me there were checkpoints at the entrance of the Waldorf dormitory and factory where her ID and face were scanned. She said, we would have our bodies and phones checked when we arrived and in the middle of the day. 
when we were leaving for the dormitory at the end of the day, they would check again because they were worried we might take a sewing needle. After we got to know the police contractors, we asked them, why are you still here watching us? They just laughed, never replied. The answer to this question was that the security workers were monitoring whether or not they were acting like submissive, re-educated industrial workers. This is what I'm sort of summarizing what she told me. So what does all of this mean? Um, well, there's a, there's a lot of different meanings that are, are, are conveyed here, but I want to zero in really on, on the, the infrastructure elements that are in play. Um, and to think through that, I, I revisited the work of Michael Mann, who's a sociologist working in the 80s, um, who came up with the concept of infrastructural power, which in my reading is a sort of materialist reframing of Foucault's biopower, um, which is you know having something to do with the increasing the circulation of things that are desired, the good, while decreasing the circulation of the bad. Um, so in a biopower frame, what you're really looking at is, is the movement of, of bodies of people. Um, and you're less concerned with you know, the, the material materiality of that experience, the, the, the material forces that, that, that shape it. Um, and so by, by actually taking the material as the analytic, um, you can start to think a little bit more about how power is produced, uh, the mechanics of it. Um, so infrastructure power um, shapes patterns of movement. It increases social control and dependency on the state. Um, uh, that's because it, it creates a, a number of channels through which people move and, and choke points, um, those checkpoints that I showed you an image of earlier. Um, it also, because it's creating an enclosure, uh, which is separating people from um, their own ownership of means of production, it, it makes them dependent on factory owners, on the state uh, for their sustenance for basic needs. It also increases surveillance by placing the state in constant contact with its citizen, citizenry. This is a key point that man is trying to make um, that infrastructure uh, creates the, the points of, con it, it, it increases the points of contact, which means it has, has more of a presence in people's lives. Um, it also extends power, technology does this in general, of people that are in control already, the owning, the colonial class, uh, to make workers more efficient and more predictable. Um, and the key thing that it, it does in this context is it, it makes it really intimate. Uh, because people wake up with their smartphone and are being tracked by their smartphone, because their faces are scanned so many times a day, their phones are scanned as well, their bodies are scanned, um, it means that the, the, the state is really sort of enclosing their thinking, their social network, and their, their bodies themselves. So what does this do to labor? Um, well, to think through this, I, I, I went back to another writer, sociologist from the 80s, uh, Michael Burroway, and thought a little bit about the compound labor regime in South Africa. Um, which was a, a segregated, mostly mining focused work camp system uh, for, for black South Africans. Um, and there's some similar, similarities there uh, between what I'm seeing in Xinjiang and, 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 and that context. Um, the major difference though, is that in South Africa, there was less of a focus on transforming the population, on teaching them to, be, um, to have quality as workers. Whereas in this context in Xinjiang, um, there's a, a real push to develop suger or basic quality for the workers. There's, there's also a, a very strong resemblance to the dormitory labor regime, which is something that the scholar Kudnai has, has um, identified as, as the most common form of, of production in Eastern China, where free, free but rural origin contingent workers who are in some cases denied access to the city, um, or, or permanent access to the city are housed at the site of production. So the dormitories are at the same sp space as the factories, which means that the factory owners can exploit them to a greater extent. There, there's a similar dynamic here, of course, that people are housed in the same way, uh, but there's, no, there, there's an unfreedom that's built into the space. People cannot leave if they don't want to leave. Um, you know, in, in Eastern China, migrants are free to starve or free to work. Uh, whereas in this context, that, that isn't even a choice that, that Uyghurs or Kazakhs are able to make. Um, 
Um, so just a final point is that the, in a colonial frontier in this space in Xinjiang, I'm not saying that this is, is, is across the entire country, um, infrastructural power is, is producing or is enabling, is shaping a, a permanent underclass of unfree laborers. Um, where people are sort of held in tension with this impulse or, or this direction to, to assimilate into the Chinese public or the, the sort of mainstream economy. While at the same time, their difference is marked and, and holds them from ever actually um, achieving that, that policy objective. So there's a contradiction that's, that's um, at the center of, of this unfreedom. So I'll leave it at that and I'll be happy to take any questions as we move through the panel. All right, thanks, Darren. I'm just going to um, jump in here um, and offer a few comments on some of the work that I'm doing. I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly so we have um, some time for questions and discussion. Um, and we already have some questions that have that have come in. So um, I, I won't take. I'll try not to take too much time uh, with this. I just wanted to start with this is just a, a screen grab of um, the China Made website um, and where you can. Uh, find out about uh, other projects that we have going on and other events um, and things like that that are happening. So I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Um, the uh, that's the uh, the URL if you um, want to visit the site. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about special economic zones and um, national new areas um, as infrastructure spaces. And I've been curious to think about you know, the special economic zone and thinking about you know, that, that, that idea of the special zone in a very large sense, um, not, not just the specific special economic zones that have been designated as such, but special zones of all sorts in China. Um, uh, but the special zone does form a kind of a, a center of the China model of development in many ways. Um, and so I've been curious about what happens if we think about that zone uh, infrastructurally. Um, Alessandro mentioned kind of infrastructural thinking as one of the kind of things we're trying to develop with the project. Um, and so what happens when we apply that to the idea of the special economic zone and the, the new area or new district or new town um, in China? And I've been looking at this question in the context of uh, Guian special uh, zone. It's Guian new area, actually. It's um, number eight there in the map. It was the eighth uh, national new area uh, established in China. The first, of course, being uh, Pudong, um, and the second, uh, Binhai and uh, Tianjin. Um, and uh, Guian was established in 2014 um, as an experimental zone um, of big data-based poverty alleviation, eco-city, uh, smart city and sponge city uh, development. Um, Guian uh, rearranges, uh, uh, I should say, Guian reimagines the administrative territory of central Guizhou with an aim to create an integrated governance uh, zone that encompasses portions of the nearby municipalities of Guian, the provincial capital, and uh, Anshun. Um, one of the uh, one of the largest cities um, in the province. And the new area rearranges these administrative spaces into uh, one core and two areas, um, as indicated there on on the map in the lower uh, lower right. Uh, the core focuses on big data and AI development and includes a new university town where most of Guian's major um, universities have built new campuses. Um, and this is also the core area is also where a massive new high-speed rail station has been built, um, currently still under construction. Um, High-end leisure residential developments um, occupy much of the built-up area here. Um, and then the two, uh, the two additional areas focus on manufacturing clusters and a culture and ecology preservation area featuring uh, cultural heritage and handicraft tourist villages as well as forest reserves and protected water, um, protected wetlands. Uh, the new area is meant to enable a level of coordinated and integrated urban planning that would not have been possible across the region's different and competing administrative territories uh, otherwise. Uh, in doing so, it is, it is also meant to develop its own sense of place-based identity, um, an identity anchored by the whole idea of big data. Big data. You see 
big data kind of symbolically uh, uh, developed throughout the landscape in all sorts of ways as not just the um, kind of economic and industrial basis of the new area, but it's, it's very kind of identity as well. Um, and also uh, artificial intelligence and virtual reality um, are big parts of that. Um, that is advanced high tech, a kind of a Southern Chinese Silicon Valley of sorts uh, where the main industry um, is the cloud. Uh, even the villages um, are meant to become high tech spaces with advanced drinking water systems like this one in Pingjai village. Um, and also they've been recently touting um, unmanned hotels for visitors where you can check in by uh, scanning a QR, QR code um, right there in, in, the, in the villages. Uh, many of the villages have been uh, beautified. Uh, this and this, if you see a village like this, this is generally an indication that this particular village um, is slated to be preserved. Um, planning documents indicate that um, 366, the, the, there's 366 natural villages within the area of the, of the, of the new area. Um, and that number will be reduced to 170 um, by 2030, cutting the rural population in half, basically. Um, and so the, the villages that remain that are not demolished um, are likely to be beautified um, and largely turned into leisure and recreation um, spaces. Uh, then, of course, uh, Guian is also one of uh, 16 sponge city pilot areas um, in China. It's it's the largest of these. Um, it's the largest of China's pilot areas. Um, there's 75 projects uh, going on to build roads, parks, and water treatment facilities um, with permeable uh, materials. Um, and uh, you know, an, an investment in just the sponge city technology of over a billion US dollars. So, um, you know, this the special zone format uh, offers an experimental scale that can be conjured outside of the state's normal hierarchy of territorial administration. If we think of this in the context of urbanization, we see the rise of national new areas like Guayan as an effort to resolve spatially via state rescaling some of the contradictions of reform-induced urbanization by reducing, uh, in particular, by reducing the power of existing municipalities over urbanization-based growth and development. Um, and so, and this is also seen in the so-called new type urbanization plans uh, focus on building urban clusters. Um, this is the urbanization plan, actually China's first explicit urbanization plan, uh, which um, was put into place uh, in 2014. Um, which um, focused on clusters creating uh, what I would say momentum for overriding at a regional scale all of the fragmented administrative territories of, of a particular um, urbanizing area. Uh, two particular interesting aspects of the new type urbanization plans, 19 urban clusters um, have a lot to do with infrastructure. Uh, first of all, the the urban, the urban clusters form the nodes of China's high-speed rail network. And secondly, they're defined in, according to a one-hour commute time, the clusters themselves, in other words. That is, the, the, the spatial extent of the cluster that's been defined in the plan um, is driven by the calculation of an optimal labor market Si uh, an optimal labor market size based on the average number of jobs accessible per worker in less than an hour's commute. And the existence of a high-speed rail within the cluster is a crucial um, factor in making that one-hour commute uh, possible. So the governance objective of rural-urban integration that you see within these clusters is being achieved via new infrastructure connectivities um, defining these new spaces of integration according to commuting times on the high-speed rail. To the extent that these are new spaces articulating new scales of urban governance, these new scales are thus defined by infrastructure. So it seems like we need to be looking at these, um, at, at these not simply as new governance and administration zones, but as fundamentally infrastructure spaces. What happens when we apply an infrastructural analytic to understanding them? That is to think about them infrastructurally. Um, so, and, and, and 
you know, Ali mentioned infrastructural thinking, and, and there's a lot to say about what this actually entails, what, what this means methodologically, conceptually, analytically. Uh, but in short, we can say that this is in, that, that it involves taking the infrastructure itself as the unit of analysis, as opposed to the bounded territorial space of the zone um, and the specific scale that such a bounded space implies. So that if we follow the infrastructure itself, um, it, it, it does not confine itself to a particular scale, but can be um, uh, scale transcending in many ways. Um, there's several provocative implications um, to doing this, I think. First, um, infrastructure can be understood as the accelerator of urbanization in China, but also as the catalyst for a new form of disaggregated urbanization that is no longer oriented around existing city centers. Instead, and this is the second point, or the second implication, I suppose, uh, we see a proliferation of urban fragments uh, throughout these spaces. Um, third, these are, uh, we can think of these spaces as agglomeration clusters defined not by proximity to a center, but by circulation throughout the territory. What matters is not proximity to the center, but rather access to and mobility through the network the network of roads and railways and, and those hard infrastructures that form the basis of the cluster. Um, however, and this is the fourth point, a great deal of land in these areas is barely touched by the grid. Um, and that is the, the kind of the rural spaces that get left behind or get um, kind of left off. And then it becomes up to those rural people to figure out some way to access and sometimes kind of hack into uh, that grid system that was overlaid on top of them, but not often, but often not with their immediate interests in, in mind. Um, and this is where we start to think um, about the social and cultural dimensions of living within this infrastructure space. Um, we're used to thinking of these spaces in linear uh, spaces in linear terms um, as spaces of rural to urban transition. Uh, but there are also spaces where multiple scales and temporalities come together, existing side by side in the form of a newly gridded uh, landscape. Uh, and this is just a kind of a fanciful rendering of Guayan uh, in the middle of this uh, painting, <laughs> kind of depicted as a uh, knot of, of, of roads um, that all kind of come together a little bit like spaghetti. Uh, the grid is a network of access to regional and national scale movements and processes laid on top of an older network of much slower and more constrained connectivity, usually with no articulation between these layers, other than what forms of connectivity can be informally hacked by the users. Um, understanding these new areas as infrastructure spaces helps us see them not as spaces of rural to urban transition as much as spaces of suspension. There's an in-betweenness to this suspension, neither here nor there, neither rural or urban, uh, neither formal or informal. Um, but suspension also entails circulation. And if we, you know, if we think about it in those terms of, of particles suspended by, by, by being in movement, by being in flow, rather than depositing and settling, right? Um, things flowing so that, um, uh, so that they can never settle. And it's this aspect of suspension that I'm after here. Uh, suspension as the opposite of deposition. Um, what does it become to live in a, as a suspended particle in the flow of life in China? And that's one of the things that I've been trying to think about more as, uh, how we might think about what it's like to live in these um, in these new kinds of infrastructural spaces. So I'll I'll just leave it at that. Um, just a kind of a um, uh, very brief rendering of some of the things I've been looking at in these zones. But I just wanted to make sure we still had time for um, some comments and questions and discussion. So I will turn it over to um, turn it back to Mark to get us going with with that part. Okay. Thank you. Thank. You. Each of you for the wonderful presentations. We are a little bit tight on times, and I'll invite the panelists to take a look at the Q&A box. If they see points or things they want to address uh, quickly in the remaining uh, minutes we have for discussion, but let me try to combine three of the questions at, uh, at the beginning 
and then there are a, a cluster of questions, particularly about the Xinjiang, I think prompted by Darren's discussion. Uh, so the first of these would be um, coming from colleagues Brian McGrath and, and Rebecca Carl uh, and Manjri Mahajan, um, friends of ICI, all of them. Um, one is kind of conceptual. So uh, Brian's asking about, um, to Ale in particular, but to the group, why not social infrastructure as a theme? Uh, a colleague of ours, uh, another colleague of ours at the New School, Miodrag Mitrasinovich, uh, talks about infrastructures of inclusion. Um, so any, any thoughts on that? Rebecca Carl uh, is asking about the utility of the concept infrastructure capitalism, you know, as a stage or a mode of capitalist development. Um, and she conveys, as you see, not so sure we need to give it that name as such. What are your thoughts about ca uh, infrastructure capitalism? And uh, a third related conceptual question uh, coming from Mandri Mahajan is, uh, you know, engaging with the broad infrastructure studies literature uh, what have you seen from your project as kind of lacuna or conceptual blind spots uh, that uh, are in are limiting in that literature, but but that your work, your project is possibly illuminating or refining? I'll start with those. Anyone? Uh, Ali, do you want me to? Uh, well, I guess I'll just start with a couple things and then um, we can kind of go around and people can fill in other things because I'm not going to get to all of those uh, those issues. Those are those are great questions to to think about, and they're in some of them we've thought more about others. Um, I, I I was I was interested in Rebecca's um, comment about uh, infrastructure of capitalism. Um, there's a uh, you know, there's a lot of blank blank capitalisms going on um, these days, and and it's interesting to see that. I you know I think I would agree that I'm not sh I'm not convinced or I'm not sure how useful um, that kind of a uh, conceptual framing or terminology uh, would be, and I think that's partly just because you know, when you look at the infrastructures themselves, I mean, you're, you're looking at such such a wide range and broad variety of, of different kinds of, of, of not just materialities, but, but of, of social processes related to those. Um, you know, in, in very broad brush terms, we talk about hard versus soft infrastructures. For example, a lot of what I look at are the kind of hard infrastructures of highways and trains and things like that. Darren has been looking much more at soft infrastructures, digital infrastructures um, of surveillance and those kinds of things. And those have very, very different implications in terms of labor, in terms of profit, um, in terms of exploit, <laughs> exploitation, extraction of, 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 um, prof of, of value and those kinds of things. A lot of what China invests in, in terms of hard infrastructures abroad, um, are are not, um, you know, are not decisions that are made uh, with a lot of profit in mind, uh, but um, but have a lot to do with um, state diplomacy and and other kinds of issues um, that I think would stretch um, the definitions of capitalism. Although state capitalism, as C.K. Lee has pointed out, you know, has, uh, is is a useful way to think about a lot of this. But a lot of what China is also investing in in places like Southeast Asia are much more profitable um, kind of soft infrastructures that would, you know, fit well within a kind of a infrastructural capitalism framework, I suppose. But I, I think it's just too too broad to capture in any meaningful sense um, all of what China is doing. Um, the other and the, I'll just add one more thing about the question about limitations um, about uh, conceptual blind spots uh, that Manjari asked and and I you know I'll just start an answer by suggesting you know one of the things that we were most interested in with the China Made project is a lot of the infrastructure studies literature um, was uh, was was being carried out in places where the key issues of capitalist development were were revolving around questions about neoliberalism and privatization of infrastructure, uh, basic kind of social infrastructure services and those kinds of things. And one of the first kind of dissatisfactions that I had that really led to a lot of the things that we were trying to do in the China Bay project was to, was to get away from a narrative about um, neoliberalism um, and kind of think about if, if we start to think about China uh, infrastructure in the context of China, um, a whole different kind of set of questions start to emerge about um, state power um, and uh, and state capitalism and these kinds of things that haven't really been hadn't been adequately addressed in a lot of the infrastructure studies 
literature, which was much more focused on neoliberalism. So that would be my first kind of conceptual blind spot that we that we've been trying to move uh, move away from. But um, Alessandro, is there other things you want to add to that, or anybody else? Um, yeah, maybe a, a couple of quick things. Uh, maybe I'll start with this with this last question as well on, on conceptual blind spots. And one thing that, that comes to mind, perhaps that is more true of anthropology than, than other disciplines, is, is a little bit of a of of, of, a, of a gap in, in, in looking at, at the connections between between infrastructure and particularly China as, as a global sort of player in infrastructure player and uh, and and the environment and conservations and i think uh, when we look at examples like like weyang right like half the city is scenery or, and half the city is, is 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 city or half the area is city and half the area is scenery um then we sort of sort of and we sort of think in, in terms of scale sort of a china as a, as a global sort of conservation actor as well um then perhaps this connection between uh, between the management of of of, of material uh, human made human made spaces and and so called spaces of nature it's something that that needs to be looked at more closely, um, and then I, I wanted to address maybe the question on on social infrastructure, um, which is great. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Um, I I think this didn't really come up in the workshop. I don't think I have a good uh, explanation for that. <laughs> maybe maybe Tim or Darren or Dorothy wants to also chime in. Um, but one thing that maybe came up and that that sort of relate relates to that. Uh, well, two things perhaps. One is that social infrastructure is, uh, uh, I guess, everywhere, but definitely in China a problematic notion in the sense as, as the camps that, that Darren was talking about could be seen as um, and from a sort of China party state perspective um, as a social infrastructure in, in themselves. Um, and, and that would sort of um, bring us to, to sort of looking uh, critically at, at what this notion itself entails, but also like the, 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 the um, infrastructure of inclusion um, uh, seems to me refers more to a sort of participatory bottom up uh, approach where uh, multiple actors are, are involved in, in particular sort of moments of planning. Um, and this is not to say that this doesn't happen in China, but I think one of the things that came up and that we um, um, find in our, in our sort of ethnographic work is that this participation happens more by sort of appropriating the language of state-led development by working through the system rather than with the system. Uh, it's a different, uh, and, and that's, that's something that, that maybe would call for a, um, for a, um, a sort of reframing or of, uh, of, of, of this of this notion for the for the Chinese context, um, which could be really interesting to do, but I don't think I don't know why that's something that really didn't come up. Um, I don't know if Dorothy want to go next or if we stick into the order. Sure. Um, I think that the, the question of social infrastructure was something we discussed quite a lot actually at our first um, China made workshop and um, there were debates about um, whether or not that would be a, not whether it should be a key component or how, but also like when we expand the definition of infrastructure, to what extent does that expand the, the scope of the project in of itself? And how does that, what problems arise um, theoretically and conceptually um, in relationship to that expansion? And so I think that implicitly a lot of the papers at least that um, have been presented at the two workshops have included that. I don't think it's specifically called out, but since a lot of our colleagues are anthropologists, that has been a very critical part um, of the discussion. For me, one of the problems with understanding the Chinese state, especially um, now that I'm back in the West, is oftentimes the Chinese state is this black box and we, um, we, we use terms like state lab development or um, state capitalism and, and those big terms um, to obscure something that we don't quite understand um, about the Chinese state. Um, and because that becomes, you know, a, a term that is easily digestible um, in the literature that we're familiar with in the West. So one of the challenges that a lot of my colleagues, at least in urban studies, are um, are, are confronted with is how do we begin to disaggregate these various types of actors? And one of the blind spots, I think, from um, the SDS literature is, is literally like disaggregating the state and the different motivations for the state and thinking about how conflicts, even within these governance structures, policies, um, uh, civil societies, and um, local groups actually create these interesting moments for infrastructural development. I think this is definitely true in Hong Kong, 
where um, infrastructure has become a territory where multiple groups have been able to claim um, uh, political ownership over, in, in, or it's become a space for different kinds of contestations, whether it's related to sovereignty or not, whether it's related to kind of living your everyday life and having water or, or having a, an affordable place to live. All of these actually do hinge on these infrastructural developments that, and this, this Hong Kong government doesn't necessarily, um, it, it, it's multiple bureaus and departments from my research actually don't have a way of addressing this comprehensively. So this idea of a sort of top-down state-led development, even in Hong Kong, um, becomes contentious. Um, and I think that that is one of the, the um, uh, issues that we have been grappling in, in all of our workshops. Um, and then the last thing that I think um, perhaps I find interesting in this endeavor is that um, there's been a huge emphasis on spaces that are produced um, throughout these three workshops, which I think are um, quite exciting. Um, and that no longer are we looking at a sort of abstract assemblages of only actors um, and governments in the state, but that we're also looking at literally the technologies that are producing these types of spaces, which is in line with STS literature. Um, but I think that it, it goes into um, a broader territory of literally thinking about territories and space and the governance regimes that are related to infrastructure and space. Thank you, Dorothy. Let's just jump in before Darren uh, and to tell the you know, that we uh, longer letter the uh, Eastern time in the U.S. And please stay if you can, because uh, we also have other questions we haven't even gotten to yet. Uh, Darren, is my Darren uh, and question uh, but other colleagues to be addressed. Um, you had a couple of you, as you saw in the question box, particularly about your research methods, your investigation, your sources, um, sort of, uh, you know, consequences thereof for you, for maybe people you've, you've talked with. And there was also an additional question about uh, to, what, to what extent do non-PRC companies realize uh, the uh, that they may be in a supply chain involved in one of these companies, uh, you know, in, in sourcing from Xinjiang? Sure, I think I caught most of what you said. We're going to extend the time a little bit and um, and then you asked the, these questions. Um, so just to comment on, on the, the previous question, just very, very briefly, um, one of the ways I like to think about infrastructure is its social effects. Um, so I think if we think about infrastructure a little too broad, if we assign infrastructure to, to, to everything, it kind of loses some of its uh, Potential and it's and 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 the way that it actually starts to sh shape um, life. So so defining it really clearly is I think important, um, and and so that's I think one of the things to keep in mind. Um, in terms of like if infrastructural capitalism, um, I mean I suppose we could talk in those ways. We could also talk about Fordist capitalism. Um, we could talk about. Uh, the eventfulness of this moment in capital de development. That's how C.K. Lee talks about it, uh, which I find useful. Um, I think we're looking at a particular, at particular dynamics um, that are in play in China and in the global, um, in, in a global China. But to answer these questions about Xinjiang, um, well, it's difficult to do research on these things. I uh, uh, you know, have not been going to the region since 2018. That was the last time I did research there. Um, and a lot of what I did then was, was more observational. It's very difficult to do field work on the ground. So most of my evidence is drawn from government sources, um, which are, are still available in, to some extent online, um, but have been archived. There's also people leaking documents um, or assisting in leaking documents um, and as you authenticate those documents, those become really good sources as well. And then I've been doing a lot of research in Kazakhstan where people are protected and, and wanting to speak about their experience using their own names. Um, we can verify the things that they're saying um, by looking at the spaces that they, they describe. Um, that said, it's, it is quite difficult. Uh, brands around the world are, there's a growing sort of awareness of this issue, uh, but inside China, supply chains are very complex. 
um, and they're actively now being obfuscated. So it makes it difficult for brands to be fully aware of, of you know, where things are sourced, um, where you know, particular moments in production are happening. Um, but I think as more pressure is brought to bear on them and as more awareness is created, they are doing more investigations on the grounds and on the ground. And some brands are already beginning to relocate their supply chains to other places. Um, so that's, I think, the state of things at this point. Okay, thank you and, and everyone. Um, again, please feel free as if you see uh, you're most interested in answering to, to take a, a, a bit of time to address it. Um, I, I did want to uh, thank Jonathan Bach for uh, putting in a question uh, and several comments too, but one um, about the internally coherent nature of the Chinese state, in internally incoherent, I should say, um, maybe coherent in other ways, but does the incoherence uh, serve as a kind of empty center a la Barth? Uh, what keeps the components in orbit, however tenuously? Um, maybe maybe the, the CCP is supposed to keep the Chinese state um, components in orbit, but uh, that's what we usually talk about in political science. Um, but, but uh, you know, uh, what about other things too? Yeah, um, <laughs> thanks, Jonathan, um, for for both the comments and the and the quest and the questions. And I would have expected um, nothing less from from Jonathan uh, on those. That's a really, I mean, those the comments are really helpful. And the and the question, I'm I'm trying to get my head around it, and. Um, you know, and maybe uh, the other panelists have a have a have more of a sense of it. But um, what keeps the components in in orbit? And um, are we? You know, I, I would I would love to have Jonathan jump in and and kind of extrapolate on that question a little bit because I'd like to hear more of what he's uh, what he's thinking about that. I don't know if we can do that, Mark, or not. But um, but uh, you know, are we talking about? Um, you know, is this kind of riffing off the idea of, of, of suspension that I was kind of thinking about in terms of, of labor and people and, 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 um, and new lifestyles and those kinds of things. And if so, um, you know, I would have to kind of, I would have to say it's the infrastructure that, that um, keeps the components um, in orbit. Um, and, uh, and an infrastructural kind of analytic is, is a way to get at that. But I'd love to hear more from Jonathan about about the question, <laughs> um, if 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 Jonathan is still is still with us, um, but and 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 if if that's going to happen, but let me let me just comment on on at least one of the other questions um, about um, about rent, um, and I don't know who this is, Science Cathedral, which is a great name, um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I think that's a really in interesting question about who is entitled to extract rent from these new urban urban networks and these infrastructural spaces, because that's, you know, it's precisely what, what is, I mean, that kind of gets at the heart of what's going on with these new areas as spaces of, of, of rescaling uh, the state um, and representing spaces of kind of intense negotiation between municipalities, local governments, um, central government, um, because extracting rent is what those <laughs> negotiations is all about. And there's no easy answer to that question. Um, and I think it differs from one place to another. In places where you have a relatively powerful municipal government, um, they are able to retain most of the power to extract the rent in these spaces. And I'm thinking about places like in the Pearl River Delta and Shenzhen, for example. Shenzhen is a great example of a municipal government that has maintained a tremendous amount of power um, in, in negotiating these kinds of things. But in the case of Guayan, where I am, it's a much weaker municipal government. And, um, uh, and, and I think the center is gonna have much more uh, leeway in terms of extracting rent and making uh, that, that region profitable for the center as much as it can. But, but these are intense negotiations that are going on and, and the, the issue of rent is really at the heart of those. So thanks for that question. I see Jonathan's on. Am I unmuted? There we go. Yeah, you're unmuted now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a surprise. Hello. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Um, great, fantastic presentations. Uh, really, really love them. Um, so, um, what was I thinking? Well, I was I was referring back to uh, I think it was a a, a, a quote from Alessandro's uh, presentation where he, he when he was talking about the shift from looking at things geopolitically to looking at things ethnographically and. You, you use the phrase internally incoherent. Um, and that's what 
got me thinking about you know, what is the, we're so used to thinking of a kind of a, or trying to impose order on this picture that we're seeing uh, and some form of coherence. And I was struck by this idea that internally there's a lot of incoherence in the state and all of us who had various experiences in trying to know that things are a lot less coherent than they seem when you're on the ground. Um, so sort of at one level, I was wondering if at the core, there's some kind of, uh, of, of lack of holding things together. We usually think of infrastructure as holding things together. I don't know, is it the infrastructure that holds things together or is, or is, or is it actually, is the question, what is it that, um, what is it that, infrastructure is holding together, right? It's not that infrastructure is the thing that holds it together. What is that infrastructure is holding together? Um, and maybe one could go off in different directions here and think that the real secret is that there is no there is no core, that it is nothing being held together, or the other is that it's something like capital that holds it all together. Um, and that also connected to what I was commenting on about this question, um, uh, about, uh, I have to just see how I, I put it in the, um, in the Q and A, uh, which I don't see anymore, but um, that um, I was really struck how the two presentations um, were uh, about water and about, um, and about Xinjiang were on the, the colonial frontier as it were, right? I think that's how, um, Darren mentioned it, right? You've got the camps on the colonial frontier, you've got water on the other colonial frontier. Um, and both of those are different kinds of flows, labor and water, but both labor and water are connected in very different ways in different contexts and different time periods through questions of capital. And capital as an infrastructure was always sort of haunting this whole thing. Uh, and I was trying to think about how capital as infrastructure is a different kind of infrastructure, or maybe it's the same kind of infrastructure, but what is it doing in terms of, 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 of making us able to think about all of these different uh, flows uh, together in some coherent whole? So these are the kind of thoughts that were sort of uh, floating around as I was, uh, as I was listening to, to you speak. I don't know if that makes it any clearer or less clear. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, no, that's great. I mean, I'm, I, I, it's, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about those questions. But while I'm doing that, I wonder if, if Dorothy or Darren or Ali want to jump in. I mean, I, I can riff off some, some, some of that, and I, I liked a lot of the ideas, of, you know, infrastructure keeping it all together. But I think one of the things that that we were we've been talking about is also how infrastructure are are made to to keep things apart as well but mm -hmm. i think one of the things that an infrastructure lens allows you to do is you know it's precisely because of the multi sort of level to which infrastructure works that you can really bring the the materiality but also the aspirational right in terms of how what how does it keep together right because it, it sort of bridges that 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 gap right to an extent without ever bridging it but the promise is always there right the enchantment as Penny Harvey puts it, right? It's always there. And so you always have that, that, that bridge and that sort of keeps that, that vision, which is central to any uh, form of political uh, and to any institution or sort of political power that, that needs to be there sort of kind of does that to an extent while failing to do it at the same time. Uh, so maybe that's an answer. And of course, the other sort of more mundane answer that you gave yourself is capital and profit. I mean, a lot of people just just eat out of infrastructure projects in China at all levels of governance. And you see that at the local level. And uh, and maybe that's also that's yeah. also a more sort of political economic answer there. But. One more thing just to throw into the mix that I was also trying to think through is um, now there's a more conventional view of infrastructure as uh, a tool of some kind that's in support of policies that you know government will use infrastructure for X, Y, or Z. Um, and obviously, we've moved a lot past that thinking in socio-technical terms. And but there's also a way in which um, infrastructure and the regime are coming to imitate itself each other in kind of funny ways. This is also what I kind of was picking up through your examples. Right. I mean, one of the features of infrastructure is it's supposed to be kind of at the same time invisible for most people. You don't really think about where your water comes from or your electricity comes from. It's it, it taken for granted at the same time that it also has an aesthetic quality to it uh, uh, and a design aesthetic quality to it. 
And this, this kind of combination of aesthetics and invisibility seems so present in the way in which the governance forms are now forming around infrastructures. And that's why I was thinking of the sponge and the cloud and uh, these, these, these fantastic images that Tim had, um, but also the, 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 the bodily embodied experiences of the, of the people in Xinjiang. Um, and, uh, and so I, I wondered whether we could think of infrastructure as a regime or, or a regime, a re I'm not quite sure what the right connecting word is. It, it's sort of infrastructure and regime become mixed in a, in a, at a new governance level. I probably have to work that out to expand that a little bit, but it, it's a little different than saying that infrastructure is a tool for governance. It, it's that infrastructure as becomes a kind of a model of governance. Governance and infrastructure are imitating each other in some, in some um, fundamental way. And that might be a shift because I was really struck by what Dorothy, Dorothy was saying about how these infrastructural crises combined with other political crises caused governance shifts. So I was trying to think that, okay, you have infrastructure crises causing governance shifts, but you also have a shift in technology infrastructure and governance, which itself is changing the nature of governance too, which is what we're seeing in all of these places. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Jonathan. That's a really, really helpful insight um, in terms of the spaces that I'm looking at. I mean, because there, you know, there, there's been a lot of scholarship on these new areas and other kinds of zones as governance experiments, right? As 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 rescaling in order to kind of achieve certain kinds of government objectives. And it's an interesting additional step then to take to think about the infrastructure if it's an infrastructure space and what that entails. Um, then, then we need to think of, of governance, uh, infrastructural governance, um, or infrastructure as a form of governance, as you put it. And what additional insights does that then provide on thinking about, you know, the question, the whole question of state rescaling? Um, because if we do think about uh, infrastructure as a unit of analysis, it that kind of explodes scale in certain ways, um, and and that changes the whole kind of dynamic about how we think about. Um, territorial governance in China. And so that's a really helpful insight. Um, but I'll turn it over to Dar Dorothy and Darren because I think there's some, you know, Jonathan's asked some kind of key issues around their um, papers as well. Um, I so in the case of Hong Kong, I, I struggle a little bit thinking of it in terms of flows of capital. In, in that particular way, even though Hong Kong does play, pay a lot of money um, in order to receive the same um, amount of water or to, to receive um, a guaranteed amount of water, the same water source from Shenzhen and that pays uh, significantly more money than other cities in the Pearl River Delta in order to have the right to have a guaranteed amount of water for the city. So there, there is a question of capital flow in that case, but I think that because the way that I framed my paper was about social and political crisis and the, the British colonial government having to address its subjects in a completely new way after these moments of crisis. Um, not necessarily better or worse, it's just that they had to shift the way that they thought about the future of the city, their involvement in it, and actually make a commitment because before um, 1967, the government, uh, British government thought that Hong Kong was a temporary thing. They didn't know how long that occupation would actually last, right? So I think for, for me, um, going back to questions of the regimes of governance, I think that that is probably a very useful framework to think about Hong Kong. Um, because I think that the way that the landscape is shaped, shapes certain narratives and then in turn is shaped by these governance regimes of management and conservation and so on and so forth, um, I think underscores the, the current government governments like legitimacy um, with the current kind of political situation in Hong Kong to a certain extent. To what extent is the management of these conservation lands necessary when a city is in crisis with housing and um, social and economic inequality? I think that those 
um, come into question. So I, I don't have an answer, but I think that those are definitely avenues to explore. And just very quickly, uh, or maybe we're out of time, uh, but very quickly, um, so I think what's happening here is a kind of controlled flow. It's something that Pud and I talks about as being on tap. That's why she talks about the dormitory labor regime in Eastern China, where you can turn it off and on. Um, but it's even more than that. You can constrict it in different ways. Um, Uyghur labor is going to Eastern China and it's going from villages in Xinjiang to urban centers in Xinjiang. Um, and it's all being controlled in those ways. It's also producing new jobs for people that are manning the checkpoints. There's like 90,000 police contractors that are in, you know, been given new jobs. Um, and so it's, it's creating the state presence that's in everyone's life and is modifying their life experience. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you to the panel for the extra time. Thank you to Jonathan for joining us here in the discussion. Thank you to uh, 60 people who stayed on at extra. Uh, and thank you to the IT team at the new school and to the ICI team, especially Grace Ho, our deputy director. Um, it, and thank you to the Luce Foundation and the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Colorado and the China Made Project, the other members of the China Made Project. We're really looking forward to, to following uh, the project as it goes along to seeing the, the China quarterly issue when it comes out. And good luck with a very successful conference later this year uh, in, at, at or virtually at uh, Asia in, Research Institute at NUS. That concludes today's uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And also just, I just wanted to mention, uh, thank you all for the really great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to uh, get to all of them. Um, I, I think they're gonna be saved and hopefully we can follow up with some direct emails to some of you for uh, to continue the conversation, but uh, really a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Absolutely.